Hello, you wonderful people, and welcome to another episode of Not Too Comic Book. This being a show, we talk about TV shows that are adaptations of comic books. For today's episode, I'm going to talk about Riverdale, Season 7, Episode 3. A lot of really interesting things went down in this episode, so let's break it down. This is such an interesting episode. Obviously, it's the whole, like, uh, the episode's titled Sex Education, because it kind of revolves around relationships and sex. Obviously, that's going to be a big part of this season. More so, like, obviously, the re relationship aspects of it. But it's such an interesting juxtaposition where it's like, there's such like, oh, I don't know what I'm doing, like the timidness of it. Obviously, it's a reflective of the fact that this is Riverdale in the 50s, but it's interesting when you think about that in conjunction with, you know, like how sexually liberated everyone was in like, I mean, throughout the entirety of the show. But even back in season one, to be fair, once again, it's a conversation about the difference between decades of like everyone being a little more like, huh, about sex, you know, kind of more buttoned up, a little tight lip. But obviously, there's some, you know, people who are a little more like, you know. How loosey goosey isn't the word, but kind of more in in tune with their sexuality more so than others. But obviously, like the more modern day, it's like yeah, like that's embraced a lot more. So obviously, you'd have that interesting juxtaposition between season one and honestly the entire series versus like some of the hookups we got this episode. It's also heartbreaking, too, because all the matchups are like, oh, it's so close yet so far. I mean, Archie's in this complicated spot where it's like Betty's into him and Veronica is into him. And Veronica is the only one that's actively making a, an attempt to go after Archie. Betty's just fantasizing about Archie because she's trying to make things work with Kevin because obviously she cares about Kevin. But it's like it's that awkward thing where it's like obviously in another reality, you're just best friends. But now you're together. But obviously he has a thing for Clay, which he finds out this episode that Clay likes boys. But now, you know, that's probably getting. In Kevin's brain turning a lot but you know once again it's so easy to recognize someone else's circumstances and not really know your own you know especially at a time like this because the only people who are pretty open with their sexuality now Tony Tony is not a, like has never hidden who she is she's always embraced who she is so I mean, at the very least it seems like in this particular time period Clay at least keeps it down low because he's like yeah I'd rather keep, like only let certain people know about my circumstances and so Kevin was just kind of like, oh, okay. Like Kevin didn't flip out or anything. Kevin was just kind of like, okay, because there's some part of him that's like, that's good to know that. But because Veronica's idea to kind of like make Archie hers, it's like, oh, let's start a kissing party, which I'm like, which is obviously supposed to also be like a, a like, because this is, a, this season's like a soft reboot, but it plays into a lot of the notions of once again, what Riverdale is to show, but also play into like some of the elements from the first season, like where the things kind of really kind of like start heating up and Veronica's always been at the heart of some uh, steamy complications because it's like, right, her and uh, Archie kissing is kind of what complicated things for Archie and Betty at the beginning. And once again, Archie and uh, Veronica dated for most of the series, but then obviously broke up when they were still teens because there's always been a him and Betty thing, but he doesn't look at Betty that way. But he also didn't look at Betty that way either back then. I mean, as a kid, he he loved her. He was like, oh, we were going to get married. But it's like, as they got older, she still had the feelings, but he was never really aware of them. But the older he got, he became a lot more aware of them. So there's so many elements. Uh, you have Cheryl who eventually starts going out with Archie because Julian suggested it because Penelope is like, yo, Cheryl, you're doing some very like unsavory stuff drawing these naked women. So I need you to get a boyfriend immediately. Julian make that happen. So he pushed Archie towards because like, hey, Archie is the representation of, oh, he's the all American kid. You know, got that, that kid, you know, it's not the same thing, but it's like that same like, oh, like a uh, small town, uh, oh, shucks you know, good guy, you know, role, you know, so, because that's never been even an inkling of a thing, I felt like maybe in season one that might have tiptoed towards something like a Cheryl and Archie, but it never happened, so, that is like one of like the, like, I guess almost like the hetero, uh, the hetero, like, hookups, that was one that never happened, I mean, because we never, because, well, prior to, Tony, we never really saw Cheryl date anyone, so we don't know, like, if, I mean, we, we know, like, the, you know, we know her history and her complicated history with her sexuality, especially because of her 
her mom's intervention and stuff like that. Once again, the Heather of it all. But other than that, like, we never got any instances of her with, like, a boyfriend. But so it's like, right. I mean, because at least there's like, hey, there's been Archie and Veronica. There's been Archie and Betty. Jughead and Veronica kissed once, which we got that in this episode, too. It was like, obviously, they were all deep into their respective couplings of Betty. I mean, uh, Archie and Veronica and Betty and Jughead. And uh, I think Veronica kissed uh, Jughead and maybe Archie kissed Betty or, uh, you know, I mean, obviously Archie and Betty have kissed before, like there's a couple times over the course of the series, but so it's just, it's just this interesting thing. Cause they're, they're playing with a lot of stuff. I think they're probably going to like play through like a lot of like the complicated relationships over the course of the series in this one season. So it's just, it's, it's fun, but it's also heartbreaking. Cause you're like, Oh, like Tony and Cheryl get together already. Archie, I don't know. I think there's like a video recently. I haven't watched it because I, I'm, I, I, I'm not sure where they're gonna land on. Was it, uh, was it Bar, uh, was it Barchi and Varchi? I think is like it's like oh they were asking KJ Apple which one is he leaning more towards? Is it Barchi or uh, Varchi? You know, it's like it, him and Betty or uh, Archie and uh, Veronica. So you know that is gonna be the ultimate. Like, what is that situation gonna be? You know, once again, it's leaned one way for so long with subtle elements of the other one. but And then it's like, oh, we're back to swinging the Archie and uh, Betty way. But let's not forget, even with those circumstances, uh, Veronica was still in love with Archie. Uh, so uh, who knows how this is all going to play out on that front. I even love the, the, the sex education class because they're trying to be very, like, modest about it. It is the whole conversation of the literal birds and the bees. And Archie's like, I don't get it. What does this have to do with plants and bees? It's like they're try they try to use this as a metaphor, but the metaphor is just too convoluted and it flew everyone's, over everyone's heads. So that ended up being such an interesting development. I love that Jughead initially wasn't going to go to the like makeout party, but he kind of had to when the principal, the guy, either he's a guidance counselor or the psychologist or whatever, and Sheriff Keller start breathing down his neck about uh, Ethel and her family's murder, which we'll circle back to that at the end. We'll, you know, let's get all the the romance and uh, relationship stuff out the way because. Uh, the, the, probably the one that isn't the most heartbreaking is probably the Cheryl of it all because she went with Archie to like the dark room and Tony's doing her thing and it's like, yo, that is the most like seductive thing ever. And you sit, Cheryl just kind of like lets out a moment like, oh, like she was like, she was, she got got in that moment and she immediately had to leave. She later on had Archie drop her home and she kissed him, but behind closed doors, she started breaking down because it's like, she's caught between like what, Everyone expects of her what she should be, and, and especially in this time frame, versus what she wants. And to me, that's also the complicated thing of like, I, I don't know. I feel like it's kind of effed up on Tony's part because Tony's on the opposite end of like really, literally everyone, including her own mom, pushing her to have a boyfriend and everything. But then, you know, Tony like, hey, I'm very like se secure in my own sexuality. I, I, I like you. I know you like me. So let me like, I'm, I, it feels like Tony's pushing a little too hard. But it's also that, that's why I'm saying it's so complicated because I've never been in that situation where like, hey, I, I you know, Oh, this other person is pretending to be something they're not, and I like them, and I know they secretly like me, so I'm going to push them to more so be who they want to be, which the sentiment is nice, but I feel like Tony's not letting Cheryl come to it in her own regard, but there's also the other end of that. Who's to say Cheryl ever would, like, come to it in her own if it wasn't for Tony pushing her, you know? I mean, Tony, once again, Tony's the one who kind of helped Cheryl, you know, out of, you know, out of her, out of the box she'd basically put her heart in for so long, like, you know, denying her, her feelings, her own sexuality, so it feel, it's almost, I mean, very much in the same vein of Tony's doing the same thing here, but it's just, it's complicated, because I'm like, I, I feel like she wasn't as abrasive, not abrasive, but she wasn't as pushy as she is now, because I feel like she didn't really push as hard with Cheryl, but to be fair, like, Tony was introduced season two, I, I want to say that was season two when that all went down, maybe three, but I feel like it might have been two, the Cheryl and Tony thing started, but, um, but yeah, I, I mean, it, it, it's, it has been that long, so I don't know if I'm just not remembering that, as I'm, my memory's not of that as clear, maybe she was exactly the same way, so, but I, I just feel bad because, like, Cheryl's so easily torn between the two, 
like between what she's supposed to, who she's supposed to be, who she has to pretend to be versus who she is, who she really is and who she wants to be with. So uh, when it actually comes to the, uh, the kissing party, uh, the interesting pairings, I love Veronica Black. Oh my God, me and Archie, who knew that was going to happen? Uh, because the different pairings ended up being um, Cheryl and Fangs, uh, Tony and Julian, Midge and Kevin, um, who was Betty and Jughead, which is kind of interesting. I mean, if you really want to break it down, I mean, it's it's old news anyway. But there's always layers to it because you always have to. You always. Because I, I try not to get in, like, actors and celebrities' business. I mean, yes, it's a public enough thing of, like, yes, like, Cole Sprouse and Lily uh, Reinhardt dated. So there's an element of that. Just, But, I mean, they wouldn't be the first couple that's ever had to, like, keep working on the same show together despite breaking up in real life. And, you know, it happens. You know, it's just, it, it just sadly, that's just how life is. But it's that. But it's also, like, right, the deeper element of, right, they dated for a while. Even though prior to this reboot, they weren't dating. Um, cause he was with Tabitha, which Tabitha's not here. She's gone. And how that's going to play out in the season. There was something I read recently. It was like, oh, why a major character was missing. I don't know whether it may be, I don't, cause I was like, I didn't know if that was in reference to Reggie. Cause I think he's on a season seven poster. I don't know how much he's going to be in this season at all. But then that's also like, right. This fifties Tabitha is in what Mississippi was like, you know, in like episode one. So the real Tabitha, no, the, the Tabitha, we know the guardian angel of Riverdale, she's all fixing everything. So who knows when she'll pop up, but they did. We might be solidifying some of these relations. Well, cause like when it's all said and done, like obviously Jughead and Tabitha will get back together, but her Veronica and him kind of had a moment like because they once they never had their moments other than like sharing a kiss or whatever but also being part of like the crew same crew like that group of four has always been tight since you know they became that group so Veronica and Jughead never became a thing but they spent the entire time talking because it's like hey I like horror movies I like horror movies too like they 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 bonded so much in that regard and also, like, when it came to Veronica uh, kissing Archie, I loved that uh, Fangs was like, jeez, like, she's going to suffocate him. And Tony's like, but what a way to go. And even Fangs was like, yeah, I'll admit it, you know. But also when she put one on Julia and even Julian was like, hey, even Fangs was like, whoa, go Tony. Look at you putting a smack down like that. So, uh, but Cheryl really leans into the whole like, hey, Archie, let's go off and. I don't know if they actually had sex or whether they just did some like hardcore making out because she has a hickey on her neck later. So, because Archie was under the impression, hey, you know, you got experience with like college older guys because that's what Julian said. So she's playing into it because she knows, like, okay, so Julian's pushing this because my mom's pushing it. So, okay, I got to play into this more. So it's like, and talking about Archie being such an animal, it's like, I don't know, if, like, I don't, I wonder how much did, how far did it go? I doubt they'd actually went as, that far. She makes it, I mean, the implication is meant to be the implication of, oh, we had sex, but we don't know if they actually did. Because part of me was wondering, did Cheryl? tell Archie what's up maybe she eventually will but it's like yeah both of your hearts aren't fully in this I mean Archie's willing to give it a go because he's like oh shucks I'm looking for love that's his thing Cheryl kind of knows where her heart is leaning but she's denying what she wants you know the heart wants what the heart wants so I love that Tony's like oh I'm playing the long game so both her and Veronica are in the same boat it's in fact the people they each want is with the other person that the other person wants so that's kind of an interesting thing but I think I don't know once again Tony's very content with her sexuality so I guess she didn't want to tell Veronica because it's like no 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 I don't want to ruin the fun it adds more fun to it you know while keeping it mysterious who the person is I'm aiming for so Betty's severely frustrated because of Kevin, even to the point she gave him the, the sex book at the end and even said, like, no, we're going to, when she had given, said, like, hey, we're going to this makeout party and it was just so limp and he wasn't really touching her. She was having to move her hands, his hands to her boobs, but it, you know, hey, it's, it's not Kevin's thing and he's just not, he's in the same boat as, um, 
I feel like Cheryl's denying her sexuality, but I feel like she's a little more aware of her feelings than Kevin is. I think Kevin might still be, I mean, maybe he's a lot more aware, but it feels like he's still a little more confused than even Cheryl is. They're both confused, but I feel like she's a few steps ahead of him in some regards. Not, not even halfway there yet, but I still feel like she's at least a few steps ahead. Um, it's actually all Alice's fault because Alice really, really pushed the whole Kevin and Betty thing. Because I'd, I'd made this a reference before. It's a very moral oral thing of like, well, why not? Uh, you know, it's like, oh, why'd you marry so-and-so? Well, why not? You know, it's it's settling and you being miserable. Yes, Alice and Hal have their issues. Obviously, we know the deep, deep, deep reasons and complications behind that in the previous Riverdale, but we don't know what the implications of whether or not Hal's a serial killer or not, but it does seem like there is a little bit of a lovelessness in that marriage. It's kind of like, well, it is what it is. I got, you know, and it's, it seemed like she was kind of putting Betty in that same boat with the Kevin thing of like, yeah, just kind of make it work out. It's like, can't you just tell her like, yeah, be with someone else. Like, why are you pushing the Kevin thing? I wonder is it because Kevin's, because could it be just the, the larger element of, well, Kevin's dad is who he is. Your His dad is the sheriff and maybe there's some play there that Alice, Alice is using Betty in that regard or maybe it's just kind of like a, oh, don't be such a fuddy-duddy um, Betty and just, you know, Kevin likes you and obviously you like him. Like, make it work. Even though it's like forcing that, it's just going to lead to them both being miserable. Like I said, it feels like how and Alice are like that. But, you know, I could easily be reading too much into it. I might just be just purely applying what they were present day in the previous Riverdale versus what they are in this 50s Riverdale. But yeah, like uh, Betty, she's like, yeah, something's got to change. She's like, or I'm literally going to explode with all this like built up sexual tension that she's not getting a release. She's not getting the satisfaction of the other side of things. Once again, Kevin got the worst advice from Alice being like, you do this and that's all she's going to want. It's like, no, Betty wants more and Kevin just doesn't know what to do with that now. So, all the messy, complicated relationship stuff out of the way. Let's kind of talk about the... We're picking up the Ethel situation. So Ethel is now claiming that a milkman killed her parents. But the complicated thing is Jughead's like, why does that seem so familiar? Turns out the comic... The company they're actually working for, Pep, actually uh, released a comic of that nature a while back. In fact... Ethel and Jughead have read it, so it's not like a, oh, uh, Ethel wouldn't know anything about it. It's like, no, she knows. We both read it together. And so he's spending the episode trying to cover uh, up for her, and it's like, well, we don't know. Because that's a complicated thing about Ethel's character over the course of the series. Like, she's always had issues, and that's why the Gargoyle King stuff worked on her, because she was filling that void. You know, and obviously we got like Ethel being in a better spot when she was kind of Jughead's right hand when he was telling the stories. So I almost wondered if we're kind of still dealing with that, with like the fact is that that story came to life because Ethel's like, oh, yeah, the milkman killed my parents. But it's like we we know that Ethel's had her issues over the course of the series and we've seen her family, her mom and her dad and how that could lead her to killing her parents. But the thing is, it's not just her that's a suspect because Jughead is doing everything he can to protect his friend because he doesn't see Ethel as a killer. He's like, I know her. She'd never do that. Now it makes him look suspicious because later on, Keller and them found the drawing that Ethel did that showed um, her like putting her parents in a meat grinder um, and Jughead hid that along with the Milkman comic. So it makes him look complicit in all of this. I mean, it's like, did they even, I mean, I don't know what the warrant situation is like in the 50s. I don't know if, like, you even really needed one. To be fair, he was already a suspect, so I guess Keller had probable calls to look in Jughead's, like, train car. I mean, it's not really even a home. It's a place he's staying, so there's some, like, legal technicalities behind that that probably makes it so you don't need a search warrant if search warrants are, in fact, a thing. Yeah, I don't know. This might predate search warrants, so... So now Jughead and Ethel are in big trouble in this regard. I want to give Ethel the benefit of the doubt, but I'm kind of 60-40. 60% that I don't think she did it, but there's still that good chunk of 40 that makes me go, I think she might have, though. And Jughead, once again, like, seeing her life, it's understandable. Like, And Ethel has always, once again, had that darker element. And, like, you know, she found something in her life that had meaning, and her parents kind of took it away from her. It seems like they have a tendency to do that a lot, so it's under, not making it okay, but you can understand 
why someone who might have, like, Ethel might have finally broke Dylan Kirk family's BS and religious stuff that she finally snapped and killed him. Doesn't make it okay, but you understand that it's somewhere inside of Ethel that she could be capable of it. It's definitely going to be interesting to ultimately see where all of this ends up taking us uh, going forward into the next episode. But really, that's all I wanted to talk about. Until the next time we meet, be happy, be safe, live life to the fullest, and enjoy it. Good day, and goodbye.